Good morning. Welcome to Mulberry Street United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're worshiping with us, whether here in person or online. We are a church on mission to share the heart of God from the heart of downtown Macon, and here's how you can be part of the mission this week. And if you'll look on the back, you'll see several announcements. The first of which is a young adult small group that will begin this Tuesday, and it's hosted by Mallory and Peyton Stone at their house, and you see the details there. Um, so if you'd like to be a part of that, you can just show up, but I'd encourage you to reach out to Mallory and Peyton, and Mallory is here this morning. Uh, second, we have Fall Festival coming up on October 30th. That's t next week. It'll be from 1.30 to 3.30 here in our parking lot. Here's how you can be part of that. First, you can donate candy. We still need candy donations. We've got tubs for it in the uh, atrium. You could do that this week, and you could do that Sunday morning next week. Also, I am challenging us, and you probably saw this in the newsletter, to get 20 trunks. So 20 different folks that will decorate their trunks or not. I want you to know this about me. When arts and crafts time came, when I was like little in elementary school, I groaned. I don't like decorating things. I don't like coloring. I never have. But I could still be a trunk because all I would need to do is come out, open my trunk, have some candy, maybe a little decoration, and then be ready to welcome and support the children who come by. So if you have not yet volunteered, you can use the connection card in front of you. Write down that you're willing to be a trunk or contact Elisa and let her know and we'll get you signed up. So let's get 20 different trunks out there. It's a great way to support the children and youth ministry of this church. Another one that came together this past Thursday is our interfaith Thanksgiving service, which is expanded this year. We're going to have eight different congregations downtown who are going to be participating together in that service. It'll be on Thursday, November 17th. You'll see more about this in the newsletter. We're gonna do a worship service in here with all eight congregations helping us lead that service. And then we're gonna do a service project in the fellowship hall following that. Both are very family friendly. The service in here will be about a half hour. And then the service project is something that kids of all ages could be a part of. So I hope that you'll invite friends and family to come be part of that. Again, that's Thursday, November 17th, and the worship service will begin at 6 p.m. Finally, on the fourth Sunday of the month, we highlight a ministry at Mulberry, and someone who is participating in that ministry gets to share with us about why they love it and why they love our church. And so Greg Elliott comes today to share with us in our Mulberry ministry moment. And thank you, Greg, for being willing to do so. Well, good morning. About six months after my wife Cindy and I were married, I was singing with the Macon Civic Chorale. That's, you know, it's called something else now. But one of the, a friend of mine in the choir, in the, in the chorale, asked me or invited me to come to Mulberry to sing with his choir in a Sunday afternoon choral program. I took him up on that. I had never been to Mulberry before, but that choral program turned into Sunday mornings. And we continued to come to Mulberry, Cindy and I, through Christmas that year and through Easter of the next. We even had a visit from our senior minister. His name was V.L. Daltrey, along with our then choir director, Ed Walker. And the reason for that visit, for that visit, was that uh, VL wanted to invite Cindy and I to make Mulberry our home. And on the Sunday after Easter of 1983, we did. We stood down here in the front before this congregation, and we pledged to serve this church with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service. So yes, the choir here at Mulberry is what brought us to this wonderful, great church. A lot has happened since that time, since 1983. We witnessed the birth of our daughter. God graced us with a child. She grew up in this church. She was baptized as an infant at this altar. She was later 
confirmed at that altar rail, along with some other girls from her, her class. She had great mentors in this church that inspired her. And to this morning, at about this time, she's standing before her congregation at Decatur First United Methodist Church, leading in song and worship. Yes, we are grateful. And God has been grateful, has been gracious to us. I've seen and have witnessed so many times over the years where God has led this church in all that we do. I'm reminded of the time when a, a hurricane coming up through the Gulf devastated New Orleans and the surrounding area. One of our youth turned to her youth minister and said, we must go and we must help them. There was no doubt in what she meant. We sent two teams to New Orleans and we worked in, we worked in homes both in the suburbs and yes, even in the Ninth Ward, if you know what that is. When I Devastating earthquake hit Port-au-Prince, Haiti. This church responded to God's call. We sent medical supplies and, yes, even a team to Haiti to give aid and comfort to those who are afflicted by that earthquake. We are now coming out of a pandemic And yes, we're still affected by it. But your church found a way through God and his guidance to forge a path forward. Our choir is back in full force. We're led by Terry Johnson, and accompanied by Zach Golden. We meet every Wednesday night and practice. This is a shameless pro plug for our choir. <laughs> but yes, I see God at work every week. I see God at work in this church on, at choir practice as we prepare for the coming, the coming Sunday and the Sundays after as we prepare our anthem, which to me is a sermon in, word, in song, which prepares you for the coming sermon in word. So yes, God is at work in this church. I saw him this past summer when Cindy and I were privileged to have been asked to help with Vacation Bible School. I saw God in every face of those children. As a new grandparent, it really struck home with me. I saw God at work through all of the leaders and the teachers of Bible School. Yes, he is at work here in this church. And yes, I have seen God at work in all of our committees I've had the privilege to serve on even the one I'm serving on now. We have a new staff. We have a new front office staff. We have a new ministerial staff. We would not have that today if God had not led us in the path that we took. So yes, when that time comes and you get that phone call, this is a shameless plug for serving. That is God calling you using the voice of whoever, whomever it is that who is calling you. So Ted, thank you for this moment this morning, giving me this opportunity. I'm very uncomfortable speaking to all of you this morning. It's just, this, this is out of my wheelhouse. But God has been gracious to us. God has been gracious to this church. And God will lead us in the days and weeks, months and years to come. Thank you.
As we continue in worship, I invite us to stand and sing hymn number 126, sing praise to God who reigns above. As we continue in worship, let us confess our common faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
You may be seated, and at this time we invite children to come forward for the children's moment. Good morning. Oh, Good morning. let's try this again. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. You know that just gives me energy when you say good morning. I have something y'all have to look at. Look at me. All right, turn around. What is this? A medal. A medal. A have you ever received a medal? Yes. Do you like receiving medals? No. No. no? Like you like trophies better? Yes. Okay. Well, I love medals or a trophy. Okay, I don't receive very many trophies, but I did receive a lot of medals. I used to just recently run what we call a half marathon. I don't run the full, the 26, but I run the 13. But I also raise money for the police department in my county. And here's one of my lovely necklaces that I received from, you want me to put it on? It's not an M&M. &M. But hey, it looks good, right? So I will tell you, running a race, we can run it in your sports that you do at school, or in a relay, or recess, or cross country. Or cross country, yes. And you can win medals or trophies, right, Carter? Yes. And I love to do that. But at the end of the race, are you tired? Oh my goodness, I am so tired when I get finished. My legs hurt, my head hurts, my body hurts, everything just hurts. But I made it. That's the cool thing is I made it because I am determined to finish. Now there was one time, I will tell you, that I did fall and I hurt my knee and I was really, really embarrassed, okay? Because a lot of people ran right past me, but then I had this really nice man he stopped, and he was really, really fast, and he stopped and he helped me, and that just made me feel so good. Now, he didn't have to carry me, thank goodness. He probably couldn't have done that, but he did help me up, and that just showed kindness, didn't it? His time on the race, he was running as fast as he could because he wanted to get a very good time on that race, but he stopped to take care of me. So needless to say, he did not win the race, but he won something else. What he, kindness, right? He showed God's love. He showed me that he cared more about me than himself. And that's what it's all about in God. Be sweet. Is to show God's love to someone else and not totally be about us, okay? I know we like to win prizes. I know we like to win, I like to win medals. But taking care of somebody else is more important because that's what God has asked us to do, right? So we can show that love. All right, let's pray. Don't you pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. We are here before you. Thank you for your love and teaching us kindness, that we always don't have to be first. You are first. In your name we pray. Amen. Walk, walk, boys. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, reading selections from that chapter. 
As for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only for me, to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength, so that through me the message might fully be proclaimed, that all, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and save me from his, for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
As we approach this time of preaching, let's pray together. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for you. Unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken. Amen. There's a poignant scene at the end of that famous 80s movie, The Breakfast Club. In that movie, a group of misfits doing Saturday detention together eventually forms a bond to take on the man. At the end of the movie, one of the main characters raises his arms in victory as he walks away from detention, the final scene before the credits begin to roll. In the background, as he pumps his fists high in the air, the song, Don't You Forget About Me, by the band Simple Minds, plays in the background. This character feels such a sense of victory because he, like many of the characters in The Breakfast Club, finally feels seen, finally feels heard, finally feels remembered, finally feels not forgotten. The Breakfast Club and that song, Don't You Forget About Me, are sometimes said to speak to the milieu of 80s teens. It says that those teens were left to their own devices to watch MTV and raise themselves by parent, uh, raise themselves because their parents were too busy climbing corporate ladders. That milieu says those teens faced a lonely existence where they indeed felt forgotten. And so it's said that this song, Don't You Forget About Me, was the voice of that generation, perfectly paired with the movie that spoke to the same. Whether or not we buy into that whole milieu for Generation X, the reality is clear. None of us like to be forgotten. Scripture has those moments too. In Isaiah chapter 43, from where we'll read in just a moment, the people feel forgotten by God. This is what's called, comes from what's called the Book of Comfort, the portion of Isaiah written after the people had been taken into exile in Babylon. Sitting there, left to their own devices, but unlike Gen X, without MTV to watch, they are worried and fearful about the future because they believe God has forgotten them. Let's hear God's response to their worries and fears of being forgotten comes from Isaiah chapter 43, and we'll read the first seven verses. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you up. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God clearly notices them, hears them, remembers them. They are no longer forgotten. We want to be noticed, heard, and remembered too. A great philosopher once said that the two greatest desires in life are to know and to be known. We want to know others and we want to be known by them. We want to know the people with whom we share life and We want to be known by them simultaneously. So feeling forgotten or being forgetful in those relationships strikes at the core of who we are. We might fail to know or we might fail to be known or both. And that's hard because that means that one or both of the greatest desires in life go unmet. Whether we were teens in the 80s or not, 
We know what it was like to feel forgotten in a relationship, to be taken for granted, to feel unseen in our emotions and our needs. It happens between parents and children, as emphasized by this 80s movie and several others. It happens in marriage relationships. It happens with adult siblings. It happens among friends. Sometimes it happens because we're just too busy. We can get so consumed managing the expectations and demands on our time and on the time of our families that we become neglectful of the relationships in our life or we ourselves end up feeling forgotten. It can happen too in valued friendships. Sometimes when we're busy, the easiest thing to cut out is our social time, which can lead to friendships being neglected and forgotten. Being busy can lead to either being forgetful or feeling forgotten, sometimes to both. And then sometimes we're forgetful because there's a history of hurt and pain in the relationship. Sometimes bitterness and resentment build up in relationships, creating not only hurt and pain, but distance. Sometimes there have been terrible actions between people who once loved each other, or within families, or among friend groups that have created separation and thus hurt and pain. Sometimes we've taken each other for granted, and when we realize it, there's hurt and pain. That's the case here in our scripture this morning. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah spend much time warning the people about how their sins, about their sins and about how they have forgotten God. The ancient Israelites took God for granted, took for granted that God would always be with them, that that God would always provide for them, that God would always look after them. They believed because they were the chosen people, no harm could befall them. God would always be there. They took God for granted. And like in any human relationship where we take our spouse or our child or our parent or our friend for granted, we wound the other person. God's heart breaks over relationship loss with God's people. And while Isaiah and many other prophets try to warn the people, they simply won't listen. So God leaves them to their own devices. God lets them do whatever they want to do. It's really the only option. Love requires freedom, and God loves them so much that God decides if they want to do their own thing, God will let them. And so they do their own thing, only to discover that when they needed God to protect them from the powerful Babylonians, they are defenseless. They have been too busy enjoying luxuries, living off the wealth they had created from trade, that they failed to see what the prophet said was coming. By the time they realized their error, It's too late. The Babylonians have destroyed the temple, destroyed the palace, most of Jerusalem, killed the king's sons in front of him, and then hauled him and the rest of the court off to Babylon. They are now prisoners of Babylon, and they sit in prison thinking to themselves that they have forgotten God. They cry out to God for restoration of relationship, confessing their forgetfulness, but initially... They are met only with silence. They busy themselves writing down their traditions so they won't forget again, which resulted in many of the books of the Old Testament we have today. They start worshiping again the best they can without a temple. But despite this religious devotion, they feel continually met by silence. We can imagine these ancient Israelites sitting in Babylon, trying to confess their sins, singing to God, don't you forget about me. That kind of relationship loss sometimes happens. Just as the Israelites had done with God, we sometimes take each other for granted. We forget each other. There's a history of hurt and pain in the relationship, perhaps. And then we're left singing, Don't you forget about me. It's a plea for attention, a hope that maybe one day we will be noticed and remembered again. What are we to do in these moments where we feel unseen, unheard, unnoticed, forgotten? 
Maybe you're living in such a moment right now. What do we do? Imagine the power and release of the people sitting in exile, feeling forgotten by God, when they hear these words from Isaiah, words we read just a moment ago. God says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. The short version, God remembers them and still loves them. Imagine being the ancient Israelites who had been met by silence and exile. And now imagine the power of hearing God speak those words. I do not forget you. I remember you. You are mine, precious in my sight, honored, and I love you. Such words wash away ill will, bitterness, and resentment that have perhaps piled up. They cover over a multitude of sins by the people against God, and they are restored into right relationship. God never forgot them. They, by their own sinfulness and forgetfulness of God, landed themselves in exile, but God will not forget and abandon them. God remembers. That's the power of our relationship with God. Unlike a church sign I saw recently that quoted God saying, I saw that. We believe in a God who forgives, who wants relationship with us so much that God never forgets us, never takes us for granted. Sometimes we can take God for granted and put distance in our relationship with God. Sometimes we can be forgetful ourselves, but God never is. God says elsewhere in Scripture, several places actually, never will I leave you nor forsake you. It's in fact the promise of Scripture. Indeed, John Wesley in his dying breath said, the best of all is God is with us. God is with us. God does not forget. God remembers. The book of comfort in Isaiah opens with chapter 40, verse 1, which reads, comfort, O comfort, my people, Indeed, these words here in chapter 43 are comforting for a people who feel forgotten by God. Indeed, the best of all is God is with us. God remembers us. God will not abandon us. We are not forgotten. And those same words are the pathway for us to restore right relationship where we have been forgetful or where we feel forgotten. Where we have been forgetful of God, we can always go back to God and say the words of verse 4. You, God, are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. And God will receive us back with open arms. That is a task where we have failed in our divine human relationship. Go to God, confess our forgetfulness, and tell God we still want relationship. When we have been forgetful in our human relationships... The path forward is the same. Imagine a husband or a wife who's been taking the other for granted, realizing the issue and going to their spouse saying, you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. The power of comfort, of release of fear, the covering over a multitude of sins and the bitterness and resentment that would have built up, all of that can come with those words. It does not fix everything, but it's a powerful start to healing and wholeness in the relationship. Where we feel forgotten and taken for granted, where we have bitterness and resentment that have built up, where we think that the parent or child or spouse or friend or other significant person in our lives has failed to remember us, where we feel forgotten, we can act as our own advocate. Before this chapter in Isaiah, The people were going to God saying the words of verse 4, You, God, are precious in our sight and honored and we love you. We can do the same. Letting the person who's been forgetful of us know we feel forgotten, but that we still honor the relationship. The person is still precious in our sight and we still love him or her. The question, the answer to our question of what to do if 
we're forgetful or feel forgotten is the same. We go to the person with the words of verse 4. You are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. Why? Because those words state firmly and fully that we are still committed to the relationship despite the history that's built up. We still want relationship with that person regardless of what has come over the years. And we can do that because God does that for us. No matter how neglectful we may have been in our relationship with God, no matter how much distance there might be between us and God, we can always go back to God with those words, you, God, are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. And God will receive us back with open arms, ready to embrace us. God loves us so much that God will never abandon us, no matter how hard we might try to abandon God. I wonder this morning, what relationships in your life need the words of verse 4? Where do you feel forgotten? Or where have you been forgetful? Who sings, don't you forget about me, about you? About whom are you singing, don't you forget about me? Go to that person and let them know you're still committed, still wanting relationship. Tell them you still love them. And if that person is God, go to God in prayer and say the same. While there's no guarantee that our friend or family member will receive our words well, God will always receive our words well, welcoming back, saying back to us, you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you. Take the first step just as we see God do here. Begin the path toward healing and wholeness today and discover that God is always with us, paving the way toward reconciliation in all of our relationships. We, none of us, are forgotten. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Holy God, today we are mindful that your Son says to us, Come, follow me. With our whole hearts we long to follow you. We believe in you. We trust in you. We're here in this church because of you. We are grateful that you sent your Son to be among us, to set the example for us. Thank you for the gift of your Son and for his abiding presence now. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who lives with us, who intercedes on our behalf, and who provides for us where we need it the most. And so, with enthusiasm and joy, we respond to your invitation this morning. We will follow you. But we know following you to be so difficult. We struggle with the demands of discipleship. The distractions of life are many. The struggles we encounter are manifold. We carry many burdens, some financial, others health-related, still others for those we love dearly. Hear us now as we lift our burdens before you, sharing with you in silent prayer our struggles. We hear you say your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Help us to experience that. Bring to bear on our lives that easy yoke and that light burden as you take your burdens from us. Teach us what it is to live outside of fear and instead in your love. Then equip us, we pray, for the ministry to which you have called us. We are on a mission for you as a church, seeking to respond to your invitation to come and follow your Son. Hear us now as we pray silently for this, your church, gathered here on the corner of First and Mulberry Streets. We are aware that this week has brought much news and with those reports, much emotion. Where we have felt victory this week, help us have empathy for those who feel defeated. 
And where we feel defeated, inspire once again your hope in our hearts, knowing that you always have the final word. We pray for our city, for our state, and for our country, and for the world. We lift before you those who struggle to find food and shelter, those in war-torn regions, and those refugees fleeing violence. We pray, too, for victims of violence, both those far away and those near to our doors. Provide your protection. Be a strong refuge for those suffering violence. And, he and offer your healing in the broken places. We are grateful this morning that you hear us, that you provide for us, and that you are good to come into the brokenness of our lives and of our world with your healing presence. And so we renew our commitment as a church to come and follow you with our whole hearts, seeking to be an obedient church. Bring to bear your kingdom through our labors and instill within us a fresh outpouring of your unconditional love. We pray this all in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite us to join together in our closing hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms.
our benediction, I recall for us the words of our anthem this morning, words from Isaiah 43. Be not afraid, for I have redeemed you. Be not afraid, I've called you by name. My love for you is everlasting. My love for you shall have no end. When you pass through the waters, I will surround you. When you pass through the floods, they will not sweep o'er. When the, you walk through the fire, you will not be consumed. You are my child. You are my child. You, all of us together, are so precious to me. Amen. Amen.